Welcome to the Perspective Doctor Podcast, brought to you by Med School Coach. Pre-med and medical students alike are encouraged to tune in each week for tips on how to become a strong med school candidate, gain acceptance into the school of your dreams, and succeed on your journey toward residency and becoming a doctor. Hello, everyone. This is Arkita here, and I'm super excited to have a very special guest, Stacey Jackson Roberts, who is a licensed clinical social worker, also known, if you hear this throughout the podcast, as a LCSW. And I'll just let her tell you a little bit about herself. Hi. It's good to see you, Arkita. It's been quite a while. But yeah, I'm Stacey Jackson Roberts. I'm a therapist in private practice in Silver Spring, Maryland. I know Arkita from our prior work together at a federally qualified health center in Baltimore, where I spent about seven years working largely with the LGBT community, um, and particularly with the transgender community. I was the lead therapist there for LGBT behavioral health and did a lot of like surgery assessments for transgender individuals seeking surgery and also training therapists how to do that. Also doing a lot of integrative care around behavioral health and those type of things. So I enter this also because from a framework of a health policy background prior to earning my MSW and becoming licensed as a licensed clinical social worker, I spent about a decade in Washington, D.C., Mm -hmm. working on healthcare policy issues and particularly access to medicines like uh, antiretrovinal AIDS medications and things like that. So I I bring kind of that lens to this too, as to to how how we expand access to care for marginalized communities. Absolutely. Like Stacey is totally a gem. And, And like she said, we work together in a federally qualified health center, which gives a lot of care to people in communities who would not have otherwise been able to receive care from healthcare professionals. And they they allow people without insurance to be seen and things like that. And just on another note, as Stacey said, she has a big background on policy. So we may have another episode on this in the future, but, (laughs) but we also work together on unionizing our healthcare organization. That's right. It's something that a lot of physicians I know I didn't know before I started there can be a part of. And and there are some programs where you may be a medical student or a resident that definitely have unions available. So it's definitely something to look into. Yeah. And particularly with the way the healthcare industry is going, it's we're seeing a lot more doctors unionize to help ensure that they have the structure that they can provide good care and not just see number after number of patients and it being all about the billable hours. So we're, we're seeing a lot of that. So anyway, it was a really rewarding experience working with you on the marketing team. Absolutely. So we mentioned a little bit about LCSWs. Can you tell us why LCSWs are a valuable component to the healthcare team? Sure. Well, I think, it, first of all, <laughs> there's a lot of different types of LCSWs. Absolutely. So- it de- depends on the type of health care team and, and whatnot. But as we did work at the Federally Qualified Health Center, I think one of the, the areas that they are most beneficial is if we can do true integrative care. So I think doctors are amazingly trained to, to kind of see things in kind of a linear fashion, like here are these symptoms and here is the treatment plan and it's very logical and here's this person before me and of course they just need to stop smoking so they don't get lung cancer, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> and yet we know that people are often engaged in emotion-driven behaviors and things like that that prevent them from actually taking the, the doctor's advice. And so within an integrative behavioral medicine model, LCSWs can actually provide care to actually address some of the behavioral aspects of medicine that are getting in the way of of patients either stopping smoking or adjusting their diet and exercise and compliance to to adjust their A1C levels with diabetes Mm -hmm. to early interventions for depression and anxiety um, or other mental health things and, and and get them and help them bridge the gap from the medical office where they may be first encountering an LCSW after a doctor's kind of pulled them in to meet with the patient Mm -hmm. to actually getting them into a therapy office where they can actually talk to somebody about their mental health challenges. And so there's, that's kind of a behavioral medicine approach. And I did a bit of that when, when we worked together before, but I also, my primary role was really the traditional therapist role. And so that's where 
instead of such a micro level perspective in working in a therapeutic environment, social workers tend to, they're trained in that, but they also have a lens that comes from a systemic perspective. What are the systems and barriers that are preventing this person from actually achieving health? And how do we address those in a way that also helps alleviate their mental health symptoms? So for instance, with the trans community and whatnot, that's often on the margins. If we're not addressing things like their housing and their access to income or economic uh, stability, then it's very difficult for them to access a surgery that may require, you know, eight to 12 weeks of recovery and Mm -hmm. dilation. If they don't do their dilation, then their new vaginal plastic may heal closed and create all sorts of other healthcare problems. So if we're looking at a more systemic perspective, the social worker through the mental health kind of framework can help address those barriers to help Mm -hmm. this person access the care they need to also help them achieve health and access the care that they need. That's an awesome explanation. And I think what you're describing is a lot of what we've been describing on this series more recently and what's been kind of in the headlines everywhere with the social determinants of health. Like a lot of those factors, not just particularly your health, but is impacted by your environment. So like you're mentioning, we may be thinking about smoking or housing or their work and, and things like that, that may help deter or help them get through a different process like a surgery and and the different barriers that may come forth. So getting them mentally set as well as to kind of combat those things that are up against them are very Sure, sure. Yeah, exactly. The example, like a lot of the clients we work with that were trans, that were accessing care, were engaged in sex work. Mm -hmm. If they're going to have a surgery that's going to prevent them from engaging in sex work for three months, then we need to have a plan in place so that they can sustain themselves for three months so they don't actually engage in sex that's going to actually harm them. Mm -hmm. And so those are some of the things that that we can do. Yep. And I think we'll probably get to this later on, but a lot of this, you know, is addressing these systems on a on a micro level with the the patient and how we can address the barriers for them. And there's also social workers that are not clinical social workers that are more addressing the macro issues. And sometimes I kind of blur the lines between those. I, I, I like bridging the gap because I think that they're a false dichotomy. And as I think you saw with the union and, and us, the mm-hmm. union is often involved in the political aspects of changing policy. So here in Baltimore or any marginalized community, we often see the social determinants of health that you were talking about mm-hmm. um, relate to environmental justice. They build uh, waste facilities and different types of facilities that are hazardous to community health near communities of color. And so here in Baltimore, we have astronomical rates of asthma amongst our community of color, along with other other issues as far as uh, hypertension and diabetes and things like that when you have food deserts and things like that. So Mm -hmm. there's a lot of interplay between racial justice and social justice and environmental justice that are all going hand in hand. And often these places like unions are not just places that are uh, involved in just work, you know, my boss is being mean to me type stuff. Mm -hmm. They are often using their their clout to advance the health of their members and their community. And so that's another way that social workers are often engaged. So my apologies for... So. Oh, no, there's <laughs> nothing to apologize. I think that this is great information. And it's something, like I said, like when I was in medical school, like a lot of our listeners are, had no idea that was going on. And as we see, like we need these advocates, we need these unions, we need these healthcare workers that are here thinking about the whole patient in their whole life and not just that moment in time where they may be in the office, because all of that contributes to their health. And we need to be advocates for our patients. Well, and I think a perfect example of that is a process that I believe that you were involved in a little bit. And that's that's how we, through our union and in collaboration with our employer, the FQHC, Mm -hmm. and several other organizations, we went to the state to change state law in Maryland Mm -hmm. to help access to care for minors. Um, We were having the law in Maryland was ambiguous about whether minors could consent to treatment with PrEP Mm -hmm. to prevent HIV. And uh, a lot of our doctors were kind of a sticky situation as to how they can actually help minors that are actively engaged in sex and other risky behaviors access PrEP without talking with their parents when they are at risk, which is a situation that might be dangerous for them if they are disclosing that they are gay or engaging in in same-sex sex. 
and things like that. So we went to the state and through our union and, and lobbied and the state in the one chamber it was unanimous and in the other chamber it was nearly 90% voted in favor of changing the law so that minors can consent to, to doing PrEP. Mm-hmm. So again, that is removing a systemic barrier to accessing care where doctors based on the clinical criteria that this patient is engaged in in high-risk behavior can be prescribed a medication to prevent HIV. Absolutely. That's healthcare advocacy in action. And that that's what we're here for to, to make, to decrease barriers so that our patients can get the care that they need. We, speaking of care that we need, um, this year has brought a lot of attention to why it's important to have marginalized groups have members of their care team who can identify with their experience. We had a, a recent discussion on our podcast about how 5% of all doctors identify as Black. Do you find that to be a part of your experience working with people who are transgendered, that they are also looking for healthcare providers that also identify? I think it is it is the case in many regards. It's not always the case because mm-hmm. at least from a psychological perspective, we have concepts of transference and countertransference. And so, for instance, I as a trans woman uh, who is white and has a graduate degree and license mm-hmm. may be in a room and the person across from me who is receiving treatment from me may be very marginalized in relation to me. And so... The unconscious can actually project a lot of feelings towards me and can actually disrupt the barrier to getting their care needs met. That's not always the case, but it can be. And so there's kind of, we need cisgender providers to be Mm -hmm. able to become more competent in trans care and also affirming and knowledgeable of systems of oppression and how they and their privilege enter the, the, the clinical space. So they can check themselves. Like I still as a trans person need to check myself that when I'm in that room as the the white transgender person that's got a degree and making a pretty good income Mm -hmm. and I'm determining whether this person gets a letter that's going to grant them access to surgery, that's a lot of power and a lot of privilege. And so I need to be conscious of how that that that's playing out in the in in that space and whether i'm adding to the barriers or whether i'm truly actually trying to address the barriers i agree with that and and as you know and everyone who's listening has probably been partaking in a lot of conversations about how if you are a part not a part of a marginalized group how can you serve as becoming a better ally in terms of supporting them whether or not it's in healthcare or not Aside from advocating politically, how how would you suggest that those who are not a part of the community become great allies for their patients? So I think some things need to happen at various levels, including <laughs> in the education system. And I think part of this is, I, I want to take a step back because I, I view this discussion mm-hmm. through the lens of both being trans, but also being Mm anti-racist. And I think that it is a very different experience of marginalization for a person of color in the United States of America Mm -hmm. than a transgender person. And so I think that the answer I just gave you, I want to kind of put an asterisk by it. I think that it's distinct that an individual of color, I can see more so desiring and needing clinicians of color more so than than trans in a certain way. And I know okay. that might be controversial for me to say, but that's because of the level of systemic racism within the medical institutions. Mm-hmm. And and so I, I can see why there's so much distrust in these systems that, that it's creating a barrier for many individuals to actually access care. And that's actually when we passed that legislation, legislation with the state of Maryland, we actually got a lot of pushback from the NAACP because Hopkins was backing it. Mm -hmm. And we know Hopkins hit history of how they've interacted with communities of color around Mm -hmm. research and consent and issues and whatnot. And so of course the NAACP kind of was a bit bristly is what, what are you doing here? Taking Mm -hmm. away parental role here. So understandably so. And so, so I think that there's a little bit, I think we need to be conscious of the power and privilege that we have. And I think medical students and providers need to really invest both in anti-racism training Mm -hmm. 
and anti-oppressant that they so they can actually understand what that means because it is a very specific concept and it's not being not racist Mm -hmm. or just being nice to your patients it is taking an active role in in actually learning the ways that you have been reinforcing these systems of oppression and unlearning them so that you leave your patients less harmed does that make sense that makes complete sense i i think that it is very important to bring up just especially like i know people may be listening from all areas of the country and maybe i don't know another country <laughs> but it it at least here where we are in the dmv region i would say like for a large amount of the population that we had seen in the baltimore area a lot of our patients are black and they have there are layer, layers to everything like we've been talking about like there may be food insecurities. Some people are working for sex, like to survive. There are sex survivors. And there are other people like, I believe trans black, black trans females have the highest rate of HIV. They have the highest rate of suicidality. So we can't look with one lens on one thing and see why when they're kind of double barriers for black trans people. And, and not saying that other people don't have other barriers, but it's, it's, it's different. You're right. And the example you just used of, of Black trans women, yet often sometimes with our colleagues that were experts in this field, I kept having to kind of bop them over the head when they were always targeting exclusively or not necessarily exclusively or primarily Black gay men. Mm-hmm. Or, or Because often the statistics are capturing trans women as Black gay men. And so a lot of the outreach efforts that organizations uh, engage in it's not that they shouldn't be outreaching to Mm -hmm. black gay men or men who have sex with men Mm -hmm. they should but there was a total erasure there of the trans women and if you're not actually paying attention to that then how are you actually treating the trans women that are coming in for care or not treating them that's a good point and are these topics coming up in your evaluations and treatment At MedSchool Coach, we know that getting into medical school is hard. In fact, 60% of pre-meds who apply to medical school don't even get accepted. And if you want to get accepted into a top medical school, it's even harder. It's a complicated process, and even students with great grades and MCAT scores get left out. That's why more students than ever are turning to MedSchool Coach for admissions advising. Our advisors are all physicians and former admissions committee members, so they know exactly what medical schools are looking for. One-on-one admissions advising from MedSchool Coach makes all the difference. Our expert team will help you develop a game plan, prepare your application, edit your essays, and coach you for interviews. Every pre-med has a story, and we'll help you tell it so you can stand out from the crowd. Visit us online at medschoolcoach.com and use offer code PODCAST10 to save 10%, up to $400 on a Med School Coach admissions advising package. You can achieve your medical school dreams and Med School Coach can help. Yeah, I, I think that that's a great point. And it brings us to, and you kind of mentioned some of the things in terms of the training, because mm-hmm. but to be honest, like physicians don't have a lot of training in terms of providing care to patients who are transgender aside from like strongly advocating that we implement some of those changes into our system aside from like one mention in one class or like personally when I went to work at the organization that both of us worked at before that was my first time ever learning not learning that trans people exist because of course like I've known a a few people who are trans but like learning about the different medications and screenings and in the in things that are medically necessary to know when we're treating special populations. I think that it shouldn't be something that should be an elective, just like we have women's health and we have urology and we have cardiology. We should be learning about all different groups and all different communities to be culturally competent. So that was my whole rant on that. But aside from implementing those things. What advice do you have for doctors who are early in their career in terms of figuring out how to navigate, how to provide care for marginalized groups, especially trans people? So I think part of this is, is an example of the, the barriers and, and where, where they lie and where as future stu- students, they can push their institutions for hopeful change. I have a, a friend, I won't disclose which institution, but I have a friend that is the manager of 
diversity services at a, let's say a top five medical school and has been specifically instructed that they are not to use words like microaggression and various concepts that are really critical to anti-oppression training and marginalization to really be able to, to help providers understand how to better relate to their, their clients. And so I think there's, when you're looking at the leadership structure and it is nearly or almost exclusively white men and the, maybe a couple of white women at these institutions that often get defensive when you're trying to actually do substantive work around anti-oppression, anti-racism within a framework that actually addresses these barriers. Because if you can't acknowledge the problem, then you're not going to address it. And so they want to do a colorblind and soften the language and whatnot, colorblind approach and soften the language. And then students are getting frustrated and you're not actually training them to actually address these social determinants of health. And they're walking out with an education that is very white male centric, just like within medicine, a lot of research is white male centric. Mm -hmm. And so things get messed. um, And we wonder why certain populations, including women, are they have heart attack misses. Mm -hmm. And people of color, you have higher mortality rates for for women that that are delivering babies and, Mm -hmm. and whatnot. So um when when the institution itself is built upon a lens that is white male centric and all the research is based around that and you can't even acknowledge it and use language to help train doctors to address and become more conscious of it then we're just reifying the system and so as as medical professionals as the individuals enter this profession it will become incumbent on them to push those changes in the system and also seek out their own training. So there are institutions that are starting to integrate this. There are institutions that are starting to do fellowship programs. And even then, they are still often within a lens that is cis-centric. Um, and so I would advise people as much as possible to get training from professionals that are also members of the community that are affected. There are professional associations that um, Mm -hmm. do a lot of this work that still have these problems that are still rooted in a lens that that isn't conscious of Mm anti-racism or conscious of cis-centrism or heteronormativity. And so they're reifying both in their training and their research really problematic frames that are not meeting the healthcare needs of the population. Does that make sense? It totally makes sense. I think just to summarize what you were saying is our leaders are, they're working with blinders on. Most of them are white men. There are, when they have diversity is usually cis white women. So when we are seeing these things in our institutions, not going the way and you're not getting the education that you want to, you guys can come together and advocate and push your leadership. You can have your your student leadership and your groups ask for these things. And and sometimes people may not think that they may work and they may not in some situations, but you can ask and you can keep pushing. Otherwise you can seek some self-directed learning as an adult learner and most especially get training from people in the community and organizations that are already in place and seek some of these fellowships and push for the next generation to get this training. And some of you may be wondering, like, why are we hosting an entire episode on this topic? But just personally, I just want to say, like, from me in my work over the years, having patients come to me and saying, this is the first place where I felt welcome as a human being, or this is the first, I have to fly. I have a patient fly to me every six months from Georgia to Maryland, because I was the only doctor that was seeing him in the area. And he went and there was no one in Georgia. So he was like, okay, I've seen you. I'm going to keep coming. Or someone who would have to drive four hours each way to see me when there are doctors all over the nation, everyone should be trained to give appropriate, thoughtful, evidence-based, human-centered care to anyone who needs it. And, and, and we need to have this as a part of the curriculum. And if you don't, you've never heard about it, now you have. 
So you need to figure out a way in order to enrich yourself so that you can be an asset for your patrons in the future. You may not go into primary care, you may not go into psychiatry, but patient or surgery, but you will have patients from all different backgrounds, including transgender patients and whatever field that you go into. And you need to figure out ways to be culturally competent and respectful as well as um, screen appropriately for the appropriate things that need to be screened and ask questions in a way that are sensitive and appropriate. So, so these are conversations that we need to start having. And, and hopefully when you listen to this, you'll go and talk to your classmates and talk to your instructors and figure out ways that you can learn more and grow. Well, and I think along the, the lines of, of the power that students may have, um, mm -hmm. they should look up um, Smith College School for Social Work um, mm -hmm. and racism. Um, just Google it. I, this is, I went to Smith for my MSW, um, mm -hmm. and in certain regards, I received a phenomenal clinical education. And one of the things I loved about Smith was their anti-racism pedagogy. That being said, despite having a very phenomenal anti-racism pedagogy, they had faculty on staff that had never been through that anti-racism pedagogy and training. Mm. And so they were admitting a student body that was of a certain mindset and being trained in a certain mindset, but the faculty were not there. Mm. And so there were often a lot of challenges and conflicts and, and emails and things would get leaked to the community that were very racist and problematic, but the community came together with the students of color and demanded change. And some faculty and staff are no longer, that were there for decades, are no longer at that institution now. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of media coverage around what happened there a few years ago. There is the power to change these institutions. And it's frustrating that anybody has to do it. Mm -hmm. It's not fair, it's not right, but you can fight for what's right and what you deserve in your education. I totally agree with that. And just from a personal tidbit for me, I went to a certain institution that isn't too bad. And we had similar things in terms of racism going on. And the black students came together and we decided to write a letter to our dean. And we decided to advocate and push until we got a cultural competence elective and, and coursework integrated into the curriculum. And I won't say how many years it's been, but it's crazily been like over, over a decade and the students are still using that curriculum. So, so you don't have to accept what you're not taught. You can advocate for change and for improving the knowledge base that you guys are paying for. You're paying tuition. You should get to learn about how to treat all patients. And that's the end of my soapbox. Well, and I, I think in this vein is, is keep in mind, it's like you're, you're receiving a phenomenal education. Mm -hmm. And that education is also rooted in white supremacy, heteronormativity, cis-centrism, masculinity, ma maleness, valuing maleness. Mm -hmm. And so we should also be applying a critical lens to, to that education so that we're making progress forward. It's not to discount it completely, but okay, where are the gaps? Where are the holes in this? And I'll, I'll use an example. So I was, I have ADHD and went to my doctor to get my refills and whatnot. And she was concerned whether I could handle the stimulant. And so she wanted to do a stress test on me. And so I said, okay, I'll do a stress test. I was not happy about it, but I'll do it. <laughs> and the morning of, I arrived to do the, st the stress test and she had called the company that makes the machine to, to see whether I should be put in the system as male or female. And some random person at the call center said male. And she didn't tell me this until after I'd taken the, the test. And I was like, okay, I have been on hormones and my body has not produced male levels of testosterone in over 10 years. There is no way that I have the stamina of someone that has. And you are now push, putting me up against somebody that is. Mm -hmm. So one just went completely around me, even though I'm a per person that I might not have a medical degree, but I can also connect you with folks that do have medical degrees and can kind of help you flush out these questions rather than calling some random person on, on the call center. And let's talk this out as to see whether 
your logic here is 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 faulty because I should not have been put in there as a male. I haven't been male in technically I don't think forever, but <laughs> I haven't had testosterone in my system at male levels in over a decade. I'm not going to perform on that test like a man. Performed much more like a woman who's much out of shape. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> So anyway, that's just one example of, I, th I think people get a very cis binary orientation and a mindset. And so it's sometimes hard for them to kind of step back and think outside the box as to how this really applies to the, the client before me. I love that you brought that up because as you know, we have all these different guidelines and things that we're doing, of course, with evidence-based medicine, but Evidence-based medicine is there to think about what reads the textbook and not necessarily patients don't always read the textbook in terms of their bodies. So it's important, like you said, to make informed decisions, of course, with evidence, but thinking through processes. Because like, for example, in terms, there's a hot topics in the news in the New England Journal of Medicine about a lot of the calculators that are calculating risk-based things for African-Americans versus Caucasian-Americans and their difference, like for instance, the renal numbers. And they say like, if you're black, you get a certain amount of points and you might not necessarily get a transplant or get put in dialysis and you're put on later because your number reads something different. So we may have to reassess what we're doing and look at the actual patients and what's going on with their bodies, like you said. Because with you having estrogen, higher levels in your body, you perform like you expected to perform. And the doctor could have kind of thought a little more critically about that. Well, and and yes, it's evidence-based, but mm -hmm. it's also what evidence-based is looking at the median 50%. Yeah. Which means that 50% on each side of that is outside of, of that medium. And mm -hmm. so, and then you've got the extreme outliers. And like I say, the trans community are all outliers. Mm -hmm. We are, you know, one to 2% of the population. And so we don't necessarily fit into this nice neat little box that people like to put, put us in. And often I've had clinicians that will respond, well, the clinical evidence doesn't suggest that. And I said, well, the clinical evidence doesn't suggest that because the research hasn't been done. The, the research, A, it doesn't collect this information or historically hasn't until recently. And even as we've adjusted recently to add like SOGI information, it really often collects it in ways that is not all that inclusive. Mm -hmm. Like I can choose to be identified as transgender or as female. And if I identify as transgender, then it loves me in with non-binary individuals and trans men. And so there's a lot of lump lumping rather than pulling apart as to what this, this question really is asking and why it's asking it. And so we often assign meaning to things that may not actually be there. At Med School Coach, we know that studying for the MCAT exam can be challenging, especially for busy students on the go. That's why our team created MCAT Prep, the only all-encompassing study app built specifically for the MCAT. MCAT Prep by Med School Coach provides student access to extremely high-quality content and a personalized curriculum for free. The app has more than 250 videos, 1,000 flashcards, and 1,000 unique MCAT questions. Plus, MCAT Prep by Med School Coach allows students to create a personalized study schedule and track progress over time. You need every competitive advantage you can get to get into medical school, and now you can put the experts from Med School Coach into your pocket. It's the closest pre-med students can come to a personal tutor without spending a penny. Download MCAT Prep by Med School Coach for free at medschoolcoach.com MCAT or download it directly from the Apple Store or Google Play Store. You can achieve your medical school dreams, and MCAT Prep by Med School Coach can help. Does that make sense? It makes complete sense. And I, I really appreciate all of the interesting conversation that we had tonight. I think tonight we had originally anticipated talking about more of like the mental health care that you give and certain populations, but we ended up talking about unions and advocacy and anti-racism and everything. So I love it. Going with that for your final question, what is one like final pearl of wisdom that you want to leave to our future physicians? Like what is one thing that you would really implore them to do? Listen, slow down and listen to your patients. Just because you have a degree and yeah, I know it's annoying that they'll use Dr. Google. 
but listen to your patients, particularly if they're on the margins. Often they haven't been listened to. And, you know, I have a medical condition that's fairly rare, but is becoming more prominent called eosinophilic esophagitis, that any time I went into the emergency room with the flare-ups from it for a year, I was written off as an upper respiratory infection, treated with steroids and sent home. And my primary care doctor treated it the same way. All the while, food was getting large, lodged in my esophagus and I was getting written off. And so, and also when I went in for those people, their automatic assumption is with a transgender person, particularly trans woman, is that it's a pulmonary embolism. Despite it being the same symptomology and me knowing my body, <laughs> I know every doctor hates hearing that, <laughs> but there, there's a pattern there. Listen to the patients. I should have been referred to a specialist that had particular training in the esophagus much earlier than having to deal with those symptoms for five years and not getting the care that I need. And that's also another example of, of, I have to go to UPenn to get a doctor that's competent in that area and is trans affirming. And so, you know, access is, is an issue. I know I said that was your last, my last question, (laughs) but you said something in that last part that is very important for our students to realize, and I don't think I verbalized it earlier when I said people were flying to me, patients look for physicians who are quote unquote trans affirming, which means like, like Stacy mentioned, she lives in Baltimore. We have the University of Maryland. We have Hopkins. 45 minutes away, we have Georgetown. We have so many hospitals in the DC metropolitan area. And she goes all the way up north because her doctor is trans affirming. All doctors should be trans affirming. I've had four surgeries this year. One of them was a hip surgery in Georgetown. Went to Georgetown, uh, not Baltimore. Mm -hmm. The three other surgeries were done in New York City this year to get access to competent, affirming care. I travel. Mm -hmm. So when you are seeing your patients, hopefully in the future, no one has to go and search for you hours away because you make them feel like a human being. And that's all I'm going to say today. So I really want to thank Stacey Jackson <laughs> Robbins, Roberts for coming today. And I want to give her a chance to say goodbye as you guys click subscribe. Thanks for having me. It's so good to see you. And I hope that we can catch up soon. And I, I'd love to come back and talk more. So Absolutely. You're welcome Perfect. anytime. Thanks, guys. Please click that subscribe button and I'll see you next week. Each episode of the Perspective Doctor podcast is brought to you by Med School Coach. To access articles, videos, webinars, and free tools to help you succeed on your journey toward med school and beyond, visit our website, perspectivedoctor.com. We hope you tune in again next time.